So there's a big difference between tactics and strategies. A strategy is a long-term uh, program versus the tactic is a short-term program. So social media are in within tactics and th they fulfill a bigger component. And the bigger component that social media fulfill is the component called communications. So communication is a big idea. And communication is done by many different things, like salespeople work in communication, um, advertising work in communication, um, public relations work in communication, social media works in communication. So the, the, the fastest growing method of communication is social media, but it's, it's, uh, it's replaced, it's sort of taking the place of other things and there will be other things that will be taking the place of social media. So we live in a, in a world where there's a cycle and a recycle of things. So it's the flavor of the moment is social media. And so recommending it is 99% of the time, but that stays tactical. So when you're a consultant, you are expected to make bigger high level uh, recommendation. And that's what I'm, my job is, to try to get you to understand what that means by the beginning of October. The difference between small and big, the difference between tactics and strategies, the understanding of opportunities and what opportunities are. So that's, that's, that's what is very important. What about the other uh, B, uh, J, 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 Bs? Have you met with a client? Professor, quick question. Yes. I'm also from the Valley Hive. Yes. Uh, our, the, um, he doesn't want to give us his financials. Is that okay? Is that normal? Um, well, what happens is the, the, the clients um, have a, a, a very peculiar way of, of going. It's... Um, it's they, because they don't know and they are not sure that you can serve any purpose for them, they are uh, in a position where they feel that this is uh, more threats than gain. So they are in a position where they're going to say, if you say, can you give us financials? They're going to say, well, our I don't really want to give you financials. Um, I, this is private and confidential. This is a private company. So I prefer to keep. So, so what happens is you have to sort of uh, develop a trust relationship with them. And uh -huh. as you develop a trust relationship, you will come up with cer certain questions. It's like, um, you know, where, what do you make the most uh, pro uh, profit on? Is it the visit? Is it the ONA? Is it the, the events? Where do you make the most profit? Uh, and we need to know that because with us knowing this, we're going to be able to see X, Y, and Z. So they need to see that you, you're not nosy, but you're looking for information in order to make better recommendations. So it's, you know, it, this is obviously a, a lot easier if they were paying us because they would feel that they're more vested. But because they are not paying us, is you have to develop a trust relationship with them, and businesses not giving any financial information that's very very rare. Uh, businesses not giving inf financial information when you ask them, can you give us financial information? That's very common. So what I'm trying to say is that you can have a second meeting. Uh, you. You could send them emails as, uh, telling them what you're working on. So you have to build a relationship with them. And then they have to see that what you're trying to do is, is you're not being nosy or you're not trying to collect information so you can give it to someone else. There are certain things that you need in order to make better recommendations. So what is it that you need? Maybe you want to know how much they sell a year. There's some big numbers that you need. So once you have a better understanding of of the situation and you, you sort of in a situation where you're a little bit stuck because maybe you want to make a recommendation that they need to hire someone additional, let's say, and that you figure that this person is going to cost them 45,000 
dollar a year, you, but let's say you need to hire five of these, but then you don't know if they can afford it. That's when you start saying, we have some recommendation that will require for us to understand your, um, your financial capacity in being able to afford certain things. And so we want to know, you know, if, so, so people, if they tell you no to a question, which is to help you to help them, that, that's not very often. So you have to get to there first. So get to know them, get to understand what you're trying to do for them, come up with specific questions, and then ask those specific questions, which is, we understand that you have private information that you don't want to give us, but there are certain uh, numbers that we need to know in order for us to be more realistic in our recommendation. And here are the three things that we need, X, Y, and Z. Okay, gotcha. Thank you for that. So, so yeah, it's, it, it happens and usually they give it to you because they see that you have a reason and that you're working. It's, it's rare that the, uh, the clients don't want you to do, to do well for them, but you have to build the trust. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So what I did is not only a well lecture and I will go through uh, some concepts that are very important, but at the same time, I supplied you some links uh, yesterday where you can see videos of the class on the various subjects and also a PDF where you'll be able to review everything. So this um, is because normally this class is a, like a three hour class and here we have an hour and 15 minutes. So that way, you, because of this, you have to use those video in order to get the information that you're not fully getting in class. However, I will try to cover these as quickly as possible. So use those links in order to catch up. Um, so th th there is a lot of business words that are very specific and you need to understand them. S segmentation, what is that? You know, what's the difference between a product and a service? What is marketing versus management? A lot of different words. What's consulting, what accounting, marketing, innovation? finance and all of this. So in business, you have to be very well aware of this. These are past clients and I want to review them sort of very quick because I want you to understand that in order to be a consultant, you have to think at a high level. So when ARPCOR came to us, one of their biggest problem, you know what it was? What is this company? It's a company uh, that um, has a very unique style of doing music because they use an electronic app. Oh. So they're a musician. What was their biggest problem? It starts with an F. What? I was going to say it's probably figuring out, like, obviously they're a rock band, not a traditional rock band. I would say it's figuring out exactly who their like target is within that that industry. Like, yes. So you're absolutely right. Their one of their biggest problem was who uh, who is their target, and in fact, who was responding to this? It was Jason. Oh, Jason. Yes, that's a very good response because figure out who's your target. The proper term would be like tar target segmentation, right? Like a specific group yeah. within a group. Yeah, within, exactly. So segmentation is the whole process of dividing. Targeting is the process of identifying within the different groups of segments, which one makes the most sense. Who you're going to target, who you're going to focus on. Because you have 6 billion people on earth and you have, they can't all be your customers. So who is your real, real best customer, at least uh, to start with and build the momentum. So it's very, very important. That is the problem in 99% of the projects. The other problem is social media. So what was the problem of Arco with the target and always social media? The, um, the forbidden band with Misha Sigon. What was his problem? Social media and with his target. What about Mattis? 
That's another band. What was the problem? Social media and um, was their target. When I did Beats by Dre, uh, their target, yeah, uh, Beats by Dre was a little different. Um, the problem they had, they didn't have a social media problem. I mean, that was, that was, they were like, the, the, they were the, the, the teacher of the teacher for when it came to social media. But they, their problem was the fact that they, their product was gonna be stereotyped eventually. Stereotyped for hip hop and high bass, big bass sound. And so that's still today the problem. And we found a solution for that. That was 10 years ago, way before even the, when he was still uh, owned by Mr. Uh, Dr. Dre. Then what we did Jay. The what? What was your solution? So the solution by uh, Beats was when you looked at the two um, uh, founder, it was Dr. Dre, and then he was another person. I think his name was some Levin or something like that. Sam Levin or something. And so Dr. Dre was obviously very famous for hip hop. And so they created this product for the hip hop. And the other one, Sam Levin, was very famous for um, uh, Western music, country music. And so then the students actually created another product that was not called Beats, but which was the, the other side of the, of the Beats, which was more of the country music sound and all of this with a, more of a country style and all of this, because we could actually see that the people that were in the country music was the most a profitable uh, music industry at the time because people didn't steal uh, country music. It's kind of funny. I didn't know that. But 10 years ago, 99% of the music was stolen on the internet. And country was a very small amount. It was a different target, different group of people. And um, we found that they didn't like the beats because obviously it was the, the wrong message, the wrong design, the wrong engineering and all this. So the students came up with the idea, therefore, of making a country music like. And so we pre presented that to Beats, and they absolutely loved it, but they were making so much money. It was like a flow of money and, and a flow of success that they didn't have the time to think about the other side of the business that we we're talking about. And eventually, they sold the brand. Um, so but that's what we uh, presented. Yes, Jason, I think you, are, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have my hand raised. Um, when you're saying that they were trying to figure out the problem for Beats that would come down the line, when it comes to our project, after speaking with Keith, he, he basically told us what he, is his biggest problem and what he would want a recommendation for. So do we continue analyzing what we would feel would be another problem, or do we try and resolve what he wants us to resolve? Yeah, yes. Okay, so that's always interesting because it's, um, I have family members that are doctors, physicians. And my family, we've had physicians for several generations. And it's funny because when I speak to the younger generation of physicians, they tell you that they have 50%, if not more, of the people that walk inside the doctor's office and say, hey, doctor, I need this medicine because I have this problem. And when I ask the older doctor, they say this almost never happened before. People would go to the doctor and say, it hurts here. You are the doctor, you tell me what it is and what I should do and how to take care of it. Now, because people use the internet, because people um, Google things and all that, they feel that they know better than the doctor. And therefore, when you're a doctor, you are now in medical school being taught that when the patient tells you what they, you should be doing, you don't listen to what they have to say because you are the doctor. Same thing with consultants. It is also very common for consultants to be told uh, what is the problem and what's the solution. But if the client knows what's the problem and what's the solution, why don't they do it? And the reality is, um, I would say almost always, 
I'm going to say 99% of the time, the client is the worst person to self-analyze themselves. And so they need someone from outside. Do they have some idea of what is going on? And can they explain that to someone else? Yes, they can. So as a consultant, what happens is you take notes of all the things that the client tells you that they, their problem is, and then you take notes of what they think are the recommendation. But at the end of the day, what you need to do is you still need to do your own independent review and looking at what are the problems. Uh, there's a client that I remember forever. Uh, the, the, this client came to us and it, it was not like this time where we had four team and four different projects. Here we have three different projects, but we, I put all the team working for the same client. And all the team came back to me and said, Professor, there's a big problem. The client doesn't want to change their name. You know, so it's like, imagine the name of the client was, my sandwich is sweet. And that client was a, a swimming pool um, a service provider, cleaning your swimming pool. And so the name is, my sandwich is sweet. And what do they do? They clean swimming pool. Why is their name so disconnected with what they do? So when we met with the client, the first thing the client says, is, they said, they said, you cannot tell us to change the name. We love this name. We think it's a perfect name and we don't want to change my sandwich is sweet for our cleaning services, pool services. And we went, okay, okay. And then we listened to everything. We did some research and all that. And we found all kinds of problems. We found that this name was a big problem. And so the day of the presentation, the client came in the class and they had a t-shirt that, that was, uh, it said, you know, my sandwich is sweet and all of this. And they, it was husband and wife. They had a, each had a car and each car was wrapped. My sandwich is sweet. Everything was branded like, like this. And so with the students who went like, how are we gonna tell them that the name of their company is gonna become more and more of a problem? And running a business is it difficult enough that you don't wanna make it more difficult because you have a brand name that is going against the success of your business. How are we gonna tell that to the client? So the first thing you do is you don't start your presentation by saying, hello, everybody, my name is Frank Wigner, and today I'm going to present My Sandwich is Sweet. The first thing I want to say is that My Sandwich is Sweet is a bad name. And we're, so you don't start like that. You do present all kinds of things that need to be presented, and then you wait for later down the road in the presentation some kind of um, diplomatic way to bring the fact that uh, you understand that they don't want to change it and so forth, but based on your research, there's many evidences that are uh, pointing at changing it, and you actually found a replacement. And we found a replacement that was so perfect. It was like a Cinderella shoe, perfect match to what they were doing. The name was available. All the social media keywords were available. The internet, www dot com was available. He was so perfect. And so that's what we presented. And the client was upset. And, you know, two years down the road, they, they went bankrupt. So you have to be diplomatic. You have to listen to what they, um, they talk about. And you have to really understand the, the difficulty of understanding what they need, which may be true of what they need but you have to do your own independent review and research. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, Lisa? it does answer my question. Yeah, it answers my question. So, it, it, sorry, it's a long answer, but I have to tell, I can't just tell you, no, you do what you think is right and don't, that's not, it's a long answer to this, but you have to do that. Um, here, our core, so that was interesting. I'm gonna show you very quickly, present you. Uh, what this, um, what the, the group did for them, and that was very unique because, um, extremely unique, because we there was a big risk in the recommendation that we did for the client, but at the same time we thought we have to do it because this could be perfect. So, if you look at the client, 
um, you will see you will see that the first name was called Arcor, and it it was this way because they came from Europe, so it was in the in the spelling from where they came from. So that's fine. There is the story. It's William Aque, who is a very successful, talented musician, playing multiple instruments, having had a full career, successful career as a musician, touring with uh, professional um, bands and so forth. But at about 40 years old, he felt he could do much more. So he came to the USA and became himself, I suppose. So himself was like this, it's actually a very athletic, um, he does a bodybuilding and he's changed his name to Will Diesel, which sounds more like sort of Americanized and created this band called Hardcore. So his look is very different. This is his look before with a suit and tie and, and this is his look now. Then his spouse, Maywen Ekwe, and she's a professional art player and not only that, she won several prizes as one of the best art player in the world. So she's not just a art player who's very good. She's the instructor of the best art player. She's just amazing, playing in various um, symphonic opera and on and so forth. Then she comes to the USA and then she's called Gwen May and she has an electronic harp that you can hold. And back when we met with them, this was a few years ago, um, there was only a handful of people that had electronic art, maybe, maybe something like four or five in the world. So this was very rare. He created this brand and I show you again how they looked before on the right side and how they looked when they came to us on the left side. So we saw a big metamorphosis. So the student looked for doing um, rock and roll for them. And so they reviewed the world of rock and roll and what they found is it was very difficult to find anything good in rock and roll because um, rock and roll was going smaller, less and less of a market. A market for electronic music, a market for hip hop, a market for country music, a market for classic call music. But, you know, uh, rock and roll is going down. So then we, with the students, I mean, we, we worked to, probably something like two months with no ideas of what to tell them to do. Could they change their social media? Oh yes, for sure. How much social media? You know, Facebook, uh, 1,000 views, Instagram, 1,000 views, so small numbers, nothing big. So there was a lot of work that could be done on social media, but that was not, not the problem. And the problem was not the social media, was that where were they gonna work? Where are they, are they more required? Who needs them more? What, what are they doing that would be more, at more impact? So then students did interview one, interview two, still no ID, interview three, still no ID. Then they said, we should do a fourth interview, interview four. And then when they did interview four, suddenly they discovered this. They said, you know what? These people, they're, they're, one of their passion is manga. Manga as a cartoon, as an anime. And so then they discovered that the anime was a, 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 an, a, an industry that was growing, fast growing. And that in anime, there was music. And in fact, with this music, they were not famous artists in the anime music as much as there is in the music industry. And the people were very loyal in the designs and the music and all of these different things. There were a lot of uh, meetings and conferences and, and um, trade shows and all this. And so then they said that's what they need to do is they need to create music, not just for rock and roll, all this, but for the manga. And so the student um, created a video to explain the client, because that's one thing to, to say that, that they wanted the client to be able to understand what they were talking about. 
So this video. And um, can you can you see the video coming? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay, so you'll see the video. And so this video was made by the students. So the it's a it's um it's like a production of different images, but they use the client music and put it on top of it. So that way they could show how their music could be used in manga, which was not the idea of the client at all. I, the client never even thought about it. So that when the client saw this, vi this video, they essentially they had tears in their eyes because it was like a, a more a, a epiphany, a moment of awakening and saying, wow, we love this. This is such a good idea that we, we feel this is right. Not only we feel this is right, but we feel that this is what we want to do. That makes so much sense. So I know this is very difficult, but that's what you have to do is you have to find a good match between what the client is, is trying to do, the, the, the targets they're trying to focus on. And um, the, the, the changes in the market and all of these different things. You have a question? So for this client question, was that video supposed to be like an intro for an anime show or is it um, like a music video? Um, it's an intro for, yes, for a show, for example. Okay, gotcha. And then they, so they, the recommendation was to try to get a, like a licensing deal with that show? Uh, no, no, no. The recommendation was stop making music for Bob, Joe, and Jennifer in the bar. Because Bob, Joe, and Jennifer in the bar uh, is a decreasing number of people. And rock and roll is a growing smaller group of people. And the electric, electric art is sort of as a, a new band, as sort of a style that even though people who like rock and roll are gonna say, I like it. They're still going to like the Rolling Stones a thousand times more. And therefore, all uh, you're going to end up doing is going from little venue to little venue and um, doing little shows, very small paid little shows to little shows. And you could post millions of pictures on the internet. It's not going to change anything. People are not really looking for what you're doing where you are doing it. However, if you were to do the exact same thing, change nothing, but you paste it, you glue it, you put it together in an environment of anime, such oh. as the video that we just did, suddenly the people watching the anime will go, gee, this is the music of that anime. Oh, this anime is better. I don't know why. Ooh, could it be the music? Wow, the music is such a perfect match. So that's what it was. Their style, oh. what they were doing was, a, was added value in the anime world where they were not. They were not even looking. They were not even thinking. But what they were doing, it was big value in that world. And how did it work out for them? Uh, that they, they, the day after the presentation, they changed everything that they did. And they consider themselves a, a, a music artist in the anime. No more bars and all this. They they uh, they change. But what happened is COVID came um, a few months after this, like six months after this. Here was COVID, and they uh, returned uh, to Europe. However, then they sort of got lucky because they are French originally. That's what we discovered. And that was just a cherry on top is that France was the second um, per habitant, the second most uh, biggest consumer of anime in the world. It was Japan number one, France number two, oh, really? USA wow. number three. So they were like, 
perfect. So they went back there and last time I heard they were doing well and they, were, they totally saw the, the opportunity for them to become big in anime and the likelihood of becoming big in all the things that they were doing as very, very small. And they also could see that their character, you know, how they look like, the style and all this, it was a perfect match. So there is a, another, um, I don't know why it doesn't appear here. Oh, no, it's here. It's here. It's not here. So there's another thing I wanted to show you because obviously it's. Um, I thought I put it on. I guess I we reopen it. But you can see it by yourself, but I want to comment on it before you see it. Is I have. Um, posted a link for the last two classes with client presentation from Bus 491. And so my recommendation is that you should really go see these. And in particular, let me look at it. This one. This one. The, they, the three are very good. Huh? Califia Farms. The three PDFs that you can find in Canvas are very good. But this one, Califia found the almond milk powder was particularly good because, because the students started working on this the first week of February and it was due on the 8th of July. And just about the 1st of July, no, let's say the 30th of June, this team told me but they were very concerned. And they were very concerned because they still had not figured out what they could tell the clients that was of any significance. So I, I'm not recommending that. I'm not recommending that you tell the night before you don't know what you're doing, but it's just for you to see that finding disruptive recommendation for a client doesn't happen in a month. Very rarely it happens in a month that you find disruptive recommendation. Um, so first week of February till the 30th of June, nothing disruptive. And they work at it. They were not lazy and all of this. And then suddenly the 1st of July, they contacted me and said, I think we found it. And not only they thought they found it, they knew. The students know when they find something that is disruptive and very helpful. Obviously, Califia Farms, could they do more social media? Yeah, they could do more social media. I mean, it doesn't hurt to do a little bit more social media, but social media is, is uh, it's a communication method. So if you have a business which is not disruptive and you communicate very well, it helps. It helps a lot. But if you have a business that is disruptive and you communicate it, that's when you have more chances of being very successful. So. These students came up with the idea. So what is Califia Farm? Califia Farm is a farm that was created about 10 years ago in California. And it was created under the, the principle that they were gonna make milk, but not milk from cows, but milk made from almond. So they made almond milk. So if you, I would say this is probably half of the, the class right now that has consumed some almond milk. Maybe some of you regularly consume almond milk, but it's something that's been growing so this business that was started as a one, uh, one person now has uh, 400 employees and makes over $300 million. So, you know, from making $200 to $350 million, a big jump. So we see they were on the right, what is called an opportunity, a growth opportunity. So when you have this kind of business, sometimes it's very difficult to come up with a good idea. So then what the students did is they identified um, a, a situation where there was more and more people consuming milk and more and more people consuming almond milk and more and more people consuming powdered milk. And there was therefore a gap here, which was since more and more people consume, consume powdered milk in order to replace milk, it's going to be the same thing with powdered almond milk. And Califia Farms 
did not produce powder um, almond milk. And there's very few companies that produce powder almond milk. And the companies that do are very small. And therefore, they are not looking like they're going to grow uh, any large sizes. So it was an opportunity, like a sort of a low hanging fruit for Califia Farms. So then they went into the analysis of the market. Uh, how would the product be pre um, presented, the benefits, who is the target, and what would be the concept of the packaging and how it would be presented and all those different things. Look at these samples because these samples will give you an idea of what is a disruptive recommendation for a client. Um, you know, increasing your posts in Instagram is a recommendation, but it's not a disruptive recommendation. It's just a, a normal recommendation. It was disruptive maybe 10 years ago because Instagram, people didn't know. And it was easy to make yourself very famous on Instagram as it was starting or, or TikTok or something like this. Now it's, it's a have to do, you know, have to. Have to do Instagram, have to do TikTok, have to do Facebook, have to do this thing. And therefore you just do it because it's part of the, business kit that you have to do. However, it's always recommend, required are opportunities, okay? So what are opportunities? Anyone knows what they are? What was the question again? What are opportunities? Well, in marketing, an opportunity could be, for example, like the almond powder, something that somebody else has never tried, but it is it is possible to go and do. Or for example, like for the Valley Hive, creating a brand for mead, there may not be so many in America. So there is an opportunity for them to go into that and be successful. Okay. Thank you for, for starting, but the, an opportunity is not doing something. So if I say um, making uh, producing electric cars, statement one, statement two, gas prices are going up. Statement one and statement two. Which one is an opportunity? Statement one, creating electric cars, or state, statement two? Gas prices are going up. Statement two. Statement two, exactly. Statement two is an opportunity. An opportunity is not what you are going to do. An opportunity is a change in the environment that you can take advantage of. Gas prices are going up, perfect. I can make electric cars. People are going camping, more and more, perfect. I can make powder almond milk. People are traveling, perfect. I can make powder almond milk. People uh, like um, don't have the space to store um, liquid almond milk, perfect. I can make powder almond milk. Powder almond milk is not an opportunity. It's the fact that people go more and more camping that is an opportunity. Okay, so um, in the uh, US met Meteo Agency, the US Weather Agency is predicting that it's gonna rain two times more in December, 2021, then it rained in December 2020. Statement one. Statement two, um, we should be buying more umbrellas to sell in our store. What's an opportunity? Statement one or statement two?
One. One, exactly. So an opportunity is a change in the market that you can take advantage of. If they predict that it's going to rain in December and you own a store, you buy more umbrella because you want to be ready when that happens and take advantage of that change in the environment. So where do you find opportunities? You find opportunities in your environment. Competitors, if you have competitors that disappear, that's an opportunity. If you have customers that are more and more customers looking for something, that's an opportunity. If you have suppliers that come with innovation, that's an opportunity. If you have um, logistics improvement, you know, like a, a train station being built closer to you, uh, airports closer to you, um, some transport company closer to you, that's an opportunity. If there's more and more young people, that's an opportunity. If there is more and more old people, that's an opportunity. The different opportunity for different businesses, depending on what you're selling. If people have um, more money to spend, that's an opportunity. Um, if people are changing their mind about something, there's a cultural change, that's an opportunity. If there is a new law that's been passed, that's in your favor, that's an opportunity. If this new law, you know, I uh, produce cognac in France and it's sold in, the, in many countries, including the US. When Donald Trump was still president, at the end of the year 2020, he changed the import law to the United States for cognac and increased the taxes uh, of cognac by 25%. So it was a law which was plus 25% uh, increase of uh, prices for cognac starting on the January 14 or whatever it was. Was that an opportunity? Well, I guess probably it was an opportunity for someone else. It was an opportunity for American whiskey that they increased the taxes of cognac, but it was a threat for me. So when you work on your SWOT analysis, what is the, do you think is the most difficult of those four? Which one? Opportunities. Opportunities, exactly. The opportunities are the hardest one because the opportunities is not about saying what you are going to do. Opportunities is about stating what is changing in the environment. So I have a little model which is called the OIST. And so I recommend you, it's inside the canvas. So now you know what it is. The OIST is to train you to actually look at opportunities. And so let me open the OIST. So the OIST is essentially saying opportunities, ideas, strategies, and tactics. So most businesses and business owners, entrepreneurs, don't think in terms of opportunities, they think in terms of ideas. Gee, I have the idea of making mead. So I'm gonna make mead, I'm gonna have to find a brand, I'm gonna have to find, um, post it on the uh, social media, and then people are gonna come and I can sell my mead. That's an idea. There's no strategy, there's no opportunities, there is no tactics, no tactics, a little bit of tactics. So how do you go around that? Then you go back to start with the O, opportunities. So what is, so there's some example here. So opportunities have to be sourced. They are not what you're gonna do. It's just using again, hardcore is popular growth of the anime manga market plus 14% according to the Wall Street Journal. So if there is a growing interest for manga, that means that's 
an opportunity for an artist that would want to do music that would be for the manga anime uh, industry. Okay. Ideas will be what you think they should be doing. Like the, 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 the simple exp simple description of what you think they should be doing. And then the strategies is going to the, 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 the concept of strategies, which is market development, product development, strategic development, and all of this. So you have to sort of divide the, all of these things to understand their, the order of importance. It's from the, the biggest to the smallest, and you don't want to confuse. So I know it is very difficult. Most people confuse IDs and they only state things in terms of IDs. But if you talk to an investor, an investor does not invest in an ID. An investor invests in an opportunity, something in the market that is changing that they can take advantage of. Okay. So um, do you have any questions? Okay, no questions. So what I'm gonna need from you is um, draft of your SWOT analysis. So I will send you um, an email just to remind you and just to send you a very brief a draft of the SWOT for your client. What you've identified, their strengths, their weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats. Um, I think I need this uh, SWOT uh, before class, I mean, for class, just the time of class next week. And that way I can guide you uh, in, in the, uh, the right direction. All right? So that's why it's important that you meet your client um, meet with Jeremy, Jeremy Jensen as soon as possible so that way you can start thinking about the SWOT. Um, you need to do some research on the, um, all the things that have to do with freight farms because you have to start building your, uh, your knowledge on the industry and what they want to do. Okay. All right, I see it's 3.15. I don't hear you anymore, so I hope there's not a technical issues, but... Um, no, we could still hear you. And still hear me. It's a very quiet class. Very really good. <laughs> Extremely quiet class. So, um, yeah. So let's do this next week, uh, first draft. You can send it to me before first week, next week but no later than uh, during class next week. All right, and if you have uh, questions, uh, email me and we can uh, always um, see what we can improve together. Any questions before we uh, set the part? No. No. So just to clarify, an opportunity is something that is not available yet or for like, like you said, there is gas prices are raising, so an opportunity that opens the opportunity for electric cars. Yes, yeah, so an opportunity is a change in the market that can be a threat for a specific company, but it can be an opportunity for another. Um, I mean, Yesterday, my, my dad sent me a picture of a game that he bought in France, and it's on uh, the concept of COVID. And it looks like a monopoly. I think everybody knows what's a monopoly. So you take a dice, you roll the dice, and then you move on different square. And depending on the square you are, you go to the hospital, or you go to the, get vaccinated, or you go get a booster, and it's, it's all playing on this. 
the game is sort of funny or you get confined. You go in a house and you have to wait for a week or whatever. And then you roll the dice, you pull a card and there's different recommendation. This game is very simple. People are buying it because the opportunity is, I guess, the, um, the cultural uh, understanding of what COVID is and the different phases that people go to. So, and that the fact that people are probably buying more, um, you know, home uh, board games or things like that because um, of the COVID situation. So opportunities are in the environment. Opportunities are not always uh, easily actionable and easily find them easily. Um, you have to sort of look around. Um, you know, let's say if you found that, and it's all hypothetical, but if you found that mead was a, a drink, a beverage, that was helping uh, boost people immunity, for example, then that would be an opportunity. Mead has been found by the FDA as boosting immunity. And then you find that people are looking to boost their immunity right now. And it's a thing that they're looking for when they're buying products. Then you could say that we're gonna do a mead that is specifically targeted towards the people that are looking for solutions to boost their immunity because boosting your immunity is a trend. So you have to constantly look for trends, look for changes that you can take advantage of. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So like you said, for an opportunity for mead, would, would an opportunity be a lot of people do not like the taste of alcohol? Mead is an all sweeter, all sweeter form of alcohol. Yeah, so you could have the opportunity that says, when drinking alcohol, the sweeter the taste, the more people like it. So most, most sweet alcohol are people, are favored by people, according to this research from 2019, 2021. And therefore you could say, based on that, we can sell meat. The problem with this is it's not it's not because people like sweeter taste that they're gonna like uh, sweeter taste that what you're doing is gonna be successful. It's unlikely that that one opportunity is sufficient in order to make your mead successful. So sometimes you have to find five, six opportunities in order to support your product. And sometimes you have to find just one. I mean, gas prices are going up plus 20% in the past six months. That in itself, just as one, one statement, could be enough to increase people buying electric cars, right? But sometimes one opportunity is not enough to support and justify an idea. So um, mead is, is definitely sweeter than most alcoholic beverages, but that the problem is people don't buy alcoholic beverages just because of the taste. You know, there's a lot of blind tests that have been made uh, using Pepsi and Coca-Cola and so forth. And even though these are the most sold uh, soda, when people are actually drinking these with other, most of the time they prefer the other it shows that there's a strong element of branding supporting the choice for a specific product when it comes to drinking. And so there's more than just the taste. So that would not be enough, but that's, that's, uh, that would be one. Do you have any other question? No, that's gonna be it. So yes, look for opportunities. Like I said, you, I would not be surprised you spend two months looking for opportunities. That's the time it takes. Okay. Yep. And so the, the O of the SWOT is the most difficult one. 
and that's the one you need to focus on the most. Uh, 